Live from Swanson Studios, you're watching the ASI Presidential Debate. Everyone, ASI Presidential Debate with Mustang News, I'm Brady Kasky. And for ASI, I'm Parker Swanson. Joining us this morning is political science junior Brian Craig and liberal arts and engineering studies junior Tess Laurie. In today's debate, each candidate will have two minutes to answer a question and one minute to follow up for a rebuttal. Before we get into the questions, each candidate will have two minutes to make an opening statement. Brian, we will start with you. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, my name is Brian Craig. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm running for ASI president. I'm currently involved in many campus organizations such as Associated Students in Planning and Phi Alpha Delta Pre-Law Fraternity. And I formerly served on the ASI Board of Directors last year where I represented the College of Liberal Arts. My platform can be best summarized by CARE, which stands for Campus Slash Community Engagement, anti-racism and diversity, equity, and inclusion, reform of campus institutions, and environment and sustainability. I decided to run because with so many students suffering from the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, we need leadership in student governments that will advocate for tangible change that is noticeable and will help students thrive in the long run. I believe my experience in student government and political leadership has given me insight into what it means to work and actually create change. Throughout this uh, debate, I will be presenting my goals for what I would like to see happen at Cal Poly and basically present uh, like tangible change that is not necessarily empty promises, but goals that I have in mind. And uh, keep in mind that with these goals, I want to work with students and faculty to ensure that students can have the best experience next year as we are headed towards into in-person learning again. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Tess, you will now have two minutes to make your opening statement. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Tess Lori. I am a third year liberal arts and engineering studies major and I have minors in religious studies and dance because I just really like school. So I am currently on the ASI Board of Directors. I was elected my first year um, to represent the College of Engineering and then re-elected my second year and was elected by my peers to serve as chair. Um, and to be completely honest, I didn't actually decide for a really long time that I was going to be running in this race. And I'm very excited to be here now. But I think my experience with ASI for a really long time had been presidential candidates like coming out with very grand platforms and, and we've seen folks do like great things but um after being in the organization for two years and realizing like we're an advisory board and and we really have like limitations in what we can and cannot do um I was struggling a lot I was like I don't know how I go out and campaign and compete with other folks who are trying to change the world in a year, which is awesome and it's altruistic. But like for me, I was like, I can't lie to people. Like I don't want to make stuff up. Um, so I think I've really been focusing my campaign on like this is what I've done. Like I've been in ASI for two years. I'm sure you're curious, like, what have you done? You got elected two times. And so my campaign basically says, This is what I've worked on, this is what I'm working on right now. And if you like the work that you're seeing, maybe have your vote for re-election to continue to serve you in the future. So I'm looking forward to sharing things I've been able to work on in the past two years. And that is my opening statement. Thank you, Tess. And thank you, Brian, for both of your opening statements. And now we will begin the questions. As a reminder, you will have two minutes to answer the question and <clears throat> a following one minute for a rebuttal. Tess, we'll start with you this time. Uh, for the first question, if you, <clears throat> if elected for president, uh, what are your two top priorities and how will you achieve them? Awesome. Okay, so I'm actually just going to start with like a pretty plain and simple answer that I think hits on a lot of the criticism I've heard about ASI um, over the years. So like first priority is making sure students actually feel supported by ASI. And I'm sure a lot of you have noticed this, but our campus is really decentralized and pretty compartmentalized. 
Um, and this means that if you're not a student who's directly involved in ASI student government, you probably do not know very much about what we do or how we operate. Um, and after being involved in the organization for two years, like it's great. It's great to reach out to folks one-on-one -on -one and to go to club meetings and to send out emails and to post on Instagram and to do all of these outreach things. But it's a 24 member board that represents 22,000 students. So it's really this grand task to, to try to get a solid amount of student input. Um, and I think for years we've had this attitude of like, oh, if students want to get involved in ASI, they should be coming to us. But that's like, that's not the case. Like it's our job to be doing outreach for them. So I think next year moving into an in-person environment is really just a great opportunity for us to reimagine how we interact with the student body. Um, simultaneously, ASI is not the best, it's not priority number two at uh, working in collaboration and partnership with campus organizations like uh, STABs, clubs, and student affairs. Um, we try to do things our way instead of like supporting other folks in their work. So for both of these issues, I'd really encourage ASI to focus on its listening skills. Like, are we really hearing from students? Are we uplifting their voices? Or are we just like speaking louder over them? Um, and basically working on our organizational ego and figuring out how we can authentically support students by leveraging our resources. Thank you, Tess. Brian, you now have two minutes to answer the question. Thank you. So my first top two, so for my top two priorities, it's really supporting freshmen and transfer students as we are going into in-person learning. And it's really just about providing more accessibility for students to thrive on campus. So for the first point of supporting freshmen and transfer students, I know that this has been like a really hard and like kind of weird year because like Every, almost every class has been virtual. I'm aware that there are even freshman students that have probably not even visited Slow County. So like some of the things I want to do is as ASI president is to really offer support in any way I can to them. I want to organize in-person events provided that public health guidelines permit to allow for freshmen and transfer students to connect with administration and faculty members and also use ASI resources to create a guide on like resources so that freshmen could be aware of like where to go to. And uh, the second point is I want to provide more accessibility for students to thrive on campus. I think like what I want to really do is focus on policy to help uh, students such as low income and first gen students uh, ways to ways to like seek resources and also fund organizations like cultural organizations and other organizations to help provide support for them. The ASI president is the co-chair of two student fee advisory committees. And I think really we need to look towards allocating resources and funds so that students could have like the best college experience on campus. Thank you, Brian. Tess, you will now have one minute for a rebuttal. Cool. Yeah, well, I think Brian actually brought up a really great point about accessibility and not only like the accessibility of our campus for um, the general student population, but I think another thing I've noticed within student government is really internal accessibility and our ability as an organization to recruit and retain diverse students within student government. Um, and so one issue we actually started working on this year was regarding scholarships. Currently only the six officer positions um, and leadership team positions receive scholarships for the work that they do. And so other students who are trying to work and advocate in this space do not receive any form of scholarship for their time and energy. Um, and unfortunately this year we, we ran into very, very complex legal issues but the exciting thing is it's been pushed all the way up to the chancellor's office and is pending legal opinion and so hopefully we'll get clarification and we'll be able to keep working on that um, next year which is awesome thank you tess brian you can now make your rebuttal statement thank you yeah tess really made a great point about how there needs to be more engagement from student government I mean, last year, the turnout rate was only 17% for the ASI presidential election, which meant that ASI student government was not really engaged in that well with 83% of the student body population. I believe I'm the best candidate to 
engage with students because I have served and worked on political campaigns within Slow County. I know how to outreach constituents and uh, look for input to provide for them to provide feedback into what issues matter to them. I really want to have like in-person events like meets and greets, uh, be able to uh, accept invitations into clubs and be willing to speak. And also just in general, I think, uh, yeah, basically more outreach is the key. And yeah, if anyone has like any questions for me just about outreach in general, uh, my email is bccred2000 at gmail.com. So just please let me know if there's anything you want to see with ASI student government, uh, with change you would like to see happening on campus. Thank you, Brian, for that answer. And thank you, Tess, as well. We'll now move on to the next question. You both touched on our students' return to campus. My question for you, as we transition to in-person learning, how specifically will you facilitate student safety while also building community? Brian, we'll go ahead and start with you this time. Yes, I think like the best thing is in light of all that has occurred, I think we need to reimagine public safety towards more community-based solutions. As I previously mentioned, I am, as ASI president, I would be serving as the co-chair of the Opportunity Fee Committee and the Student Success Fee Advisory Committee. And I believe the best thing to do is to reach out to campus organizations and like to provide, uh, to help uh, make them more aware of like what they can fund for. And then as ASI president, I want to work to allocate student fees towards what I believe would be like the best solution or what the students believe would be the best solution to ensure that public safety occurs. Thank you, Brian. Tess, you will now have two minutes to respond. Awesome, okay. So I wanna be really mindful of the fact that I think when we're returning to in-person learning, um, students are going to have very different comfort levels coming back to campus and they're going to be in very different spaces and places than they were in the past year. So I think the best thing we can really do is continue to follow all of the public health guidelines. If that means wearing PPE, sanitizing, social distancing, however that looks in the fall, but also being super transparent about what we're doing to keep students safe. Um, I think like knowledge and information is a really powerful thing and the more transparent we can be specifically with ASI facilities in terms of what we're doing, like that's when a student is going to feel comfortable coming back onto campus and re-engaging when they know that we are being safe and mindful about their health and their safety. Um, in terms of building community, I think we really need to work on meeting the needs of students in new ways and like specifically things that have emerged out of the pandemic. Um, so we were talking about this in workshop on Monday, which is like a board space, but thinking about like safe and quiet spaces for students who may be struggling with social anxiety um, or safe spaces in the rec for students who may be struggling with their body image. Like there's lots of very simple changes we can make to physical spaces on campus to make sure students are really comfortable re-engaging when they're trying to come back to like normal because it's not going to quite be normal yet, right? And then also let's be really mindful and not jump in immediately to like settling for a new normal. So really what do students want and need out of their um, college experience? And this may mean expanding our traditional ideas of programming and getting really creative. Um, we don't have to do things how we've always done things. And this is such a great opportunity to really rebuild in a mindful way so that students feel safe and welcome on our campus. Thank you, Tess. Brian, you will now have a one minute rebuttal. Thank you, Parker. So basically what I think is key to like, as kind of what Tess was mentioning, uh, to make, ensure that students feel safe on campus once uh, we return back to in-person learning is, I think as ASI president, I really want to work with public health officials and even local government officials along with the administration to ensure what levels of safety we can provide in order to ensure that all students like relatively feel comfortable going back into in-person class. I know that during the pandemic, this has been like an anxious time for so many students. And I just want to ensure like as well that we uh, look and support uh, resources for mental health as well as we are uh, going back 
to class. Thank you, Brian. Tess, one minute on the clock for your rebuttal. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think to Brian's point, like obviously mental health services are going to be huge. And I think we've already heard campus administration has realized this is a need and is really stepping up um, in this space, which is just, it's exciting and it's important. But I think one thing just to reemphasize, we may be back to in-person next year, but it's not going to be normal yet. Like we're not at normal and I think that's been the theme of this year and all the different spaces I've been able to be in is just reminding folks to have like empathy for each other and to have grace and to provide space because we are moving back into an environment and there's so much pressure to return to normal but so much has changed and so I think that's going to be the biggest thing for next year and in, in terms of community building is realizing like folks are coming back to campus in all different spaces and feelings and emotions and like it's our responsibility to not just like gloss over that and to acknowledge it and to support them. Thank you, Tess. We will now move on to question three. Uh, how have you advocated for marginalized students in the past and what are your plans for the future? Tess, you have two minutes to respond. Okay, cool. I'm going to try to squeeze in as much as I can in two minutes. So I think my first year I really got involved in student government because I was really passionate about basic needs. So I ended up working with Swipe Out Hunger, which is a really amazing club on campus trying to combat food insecurity for about nine months to change the Mustang meal share donation policy to make it easier for students to donate their unused dining dollars. Um, that was like a very exciting thing that was changed at the end of last year. So shout out to Campus Dining and Cal Poly Corporation for working with us in, in collaboration. I've also had the opportunity to work with student parents on our campus to revise the class attendance policy to include students with dependents. Um, this year, myself and ASI President Shana Lynch have actually helped bring attention to student parents within the CSU system at the Cal State Student Association, which is like the student government of student governments. So we're actually working with student parents right now. Shout out to Jasmine. Um, on efforts to encourage the chancellor to collect data system-wide, which would be huge and that could allow for a lot of great opportunities for grants and resources. Um, additionally, like simpler things a few weeks, simple but very important. A few weeks ago, we connected with one of the student assistants from the Pride Center about concerns about having a large enough physical space in the fall to be able to have students come in and have a physical space where they could host events. Um, and so myself and the chair of the, the UUAD um, Cole Doris were able to meet with the student and like suggest ASI policy modifications to provide LGBTQ plus students with safe and adequate space during the fall. Um, I think like many of these projects come from listening to student needs and as a student who holds a lot of privileged identities, it's certainly not my place to decide what marginalized students need or don't need. It's my job to listen and to support. And so I think I've been doing that for the past two years and I would love to be able to continue to do that as ASI president next year. Awesome. Thank you, Tess. Brian, please go ahead. You have two minutes. Thank you, Brady. So during my time, or how do I say this? So just to begin with like diversity, equity and inclusion will be woven into any work and advocacy that I do as ASI president no matter like what the issue is. So I just want to start with that first off. Uh, but then during my time on the ASI Board of Directors, I successfully passed an endorsement of a bill in the California State Legislature that would require every student starting in 2024 to take a course in ethnic studies as part of their GE. And I also advocate for the funding of cultural organizations such as like the Black Academic Excellence Center, Dream Center, and the Cross Cultural Centers. So those are some of the things I did last year. In terms of advocating for marginalized students in the future, some of my goals are to create a long-term action plan to adequately fund campus organizations that support students of color. Many of them have been underfunded for so many years, and I think it's time that we start working on a plan to ensure that they can provide support and resources for students of color. I, the next thing I want to do is reform the partner school program to attract higher rates of historically marginalized students, because right now there's a program in place to try and attract students, but however, like because of like tuition and all that goes on at Cal Poly, 
uh, it hasn't really been effective. So I think we just need to find more solutions, perhaps through scholarships. And I also thoroughly just, I want to have like conversations with the administration about how they've handled racism incidents in the past. Like I've, I've spoken with students of color and like, they're just like always like, many of them are just always like worried like the way administration has responded in the past. So I think like I want to, as ASI president, I just want to have a good conversation about that and just to ensure that there needs to be a better response to these sort of things. Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> Tess, you will now have one minute for a rebuttal. Cool. Okay. I don't even know if this is going to take a whole minute. I just want to say shout out to Brian. I think that's like a really great point in terms of DEI being more of a lens and like, again, things that ASI sometimes struggles with. Like ASI sometimes like to, likes to compartmentalize DEI. So it's like you have a DEI position, you have a DEI secretary. Um, and a lot of times like the work within our organization falls on a very select few. So one thing we've really been brainstorming this year kind of as an organization is how do you increase that internal accountability and that internal cultural competency as ASI as a whole so that DEI is treated as a lens by all folks and like not just a couple of folks who are on the committees. So great point, Brian. Thank you, Tess. Brian, you have one minute for a rebuttal. Oh, thank you. I also think you like made some great points as well, Tess. And I just want to say like in, for my rebuttal in terms of like ASI student government, I do think there needs to be reforms in terms of accessibility with uh, helping uh, students of color thrive and succeed at ASI student government. Uh, because of like the effects of this pandemic, I did account and there were ASI student government like had one of the highest turnover rates this year with eight students resigning, five of whom were people of color. And like, this has been like, uh, even though numbers have been lower, this has been like traditional, like there has been high turnover rates with students of color. And I think it just shows kind of like the inaccessibility that goes on. I really want to work with like the diversity and inclusion committee to try and stop this from happening. I know it's going to take some time, but I think working like to try and get scholarships is a crucial thing. And just like creating a more inclusive environment, perhaps diversifying more of the student government staff to help uh, students, leaders just uh, succeed in advocating for students. Thank you to both candidates for your thoughts on that question, as well as the very respectful rebuttal. As I'm sure you both know, COVID-19 has brought with it many challenges for many of our students. Our next question for you both is, in light of the pandemic, how will ASI ensure that students' basic needs are met? Brian, we'll begin with you. You have two minutes. Yes. So in terms of basic needs, I think really the big focus is on like food and shelter. And I want to take their steps to ensure that all students have secure access to those resources. Already, we are seeing campus administration uh, increasing housing fees by 9% while also requiring second year students in certain colleges to go into on-campus housing while, while there are cheaper options in the city. And I'm really concerned that this is going to displace low income students and students of color. And I really want to like address this as ASI president, work with students and even community organizations to try and curtail the effects of this. Also just some ideas in general is to perhaps work with the University Union Advisory Board to find space to establishing accessible food pantry, perhaps within the University Union. I think uh, students with food insecurity would have like more access and would be able to find, it would be more clear for them to find where to uh, receive support for food. And I also just, Another thing is I want to really work with campus dining to have more vegan and vegetarian options. A lot of the options that campus dining has right now, well, there is like some good food such as like pizza and burgers, which that's my favorite. I mean, there's just not a lot of like healthy options. And I think really just working to ensure to try and provide those more options 
which help create more uh, healthier options and like better food for students. Thank you, Brian, for your answer to that question. Tess, the floor is yours for two minutes. Awesome. Okay, so in light of the pandemic, yes, but also just like all the time, like this should be an institutionalized priority. Um, I think this is something that I'm really, really excited to talk about right now because ASI has really jumped on this issue this year. And so myself, ASI President Shana Lynch and the UAB Chair Cole Doris all kind of sat down at the beginning of the year and were like, hey, like, this is the time that ASI needs to step up and our budget has to reflect the fact that we are supporting um, all students on this campus and not just like students who we've traditionally supported, which if we're being completely honest, we have not chosen to support students of color and marginalized students in the past through our budget. So we kind of said basic needs is something that CSSA, Cal State Student Association agreed was a priority. That was something that was really close to my heart. That was something we had began a lot of work on last year. Um, and we introduced over $120,000 of budget reallocations this year. So we, we introduced a proposal to fund the food pantry, which was approved by board for the next three years. Um, we also proposed the second proposal that was repetitive to give one-time funding to Cal Poly CARES. And while this was great, I really think we need to continue to be critical about how we use our money in supporting student basic needs. Um, and this is like why I ran and why I got involved in the first place. Because when you look at the structures we have on campus, you kind of ask, do these make sense? Are these accessible? And while some of our programs are amazing, there's still tremendous obstacles and challenges for many of our emergency programs. And specifically when we look at um, aid and requirements for receiving aid, we a lot of times will ask students to take out all of their loans unsubsidized and subsidized. So I think there's a lot of growth in terms of campus programs and restructuring, and it's really student government's jobs to get in the weeds and do our best to advocate for students' basic needs. Thank you, Tess, for your response. Brian, one minute on the clock for your rebuttal. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I just want to say I think ASI student government has uh, done some great work in terms of improving uh, food security on campus. However, uh, with that in mind, I just think we need to like really focus more and emphasize in terms of housing because like as I said previously, with housing, it's going to be raised for dormitories by 6% and how, uh, apart student apartments by 9%. And I know uh, students like are not really, many students like that do not have housing are not as likely going to be succeed into campus. And I think really we just need to ensure well, by working with university housing to ensure ways to have students like be housed and just like try to work towards perhaps applying for lowering the fees or even abolishing, I would even go as far as abolishing the second year mandatory housing requirement just so that uh, students have more access to on campus or off campus housing as well, which is much cheaper. Thank you, Brian, for that rebuttal. Tess, we'll close out this question with your rebuttal. You have one minute. Okay, cool. So first of all, shout out to Isla, Trevor, Trenton, and Sharon, because they actually kind of identified this huge gap in terms of housing and security. And I'm happy Brian brought that up. Um, I don't know if any of y'all saw like the Instagram post about like the safe parking program, but we're kind of trying to explore that collaboratively with the university right now. Um, we have systems that are put in place that are designed to be supporting housing and secure students, but we found that students don't want to put themselves into student debt. So they'll do things like sleep out of their cars or couch surf. And so I don't think that the university always realizes when we set up these structures that they're going to cause consequences like that. Um, and this is like something we're working on right now. So hopefully I hope y'all keep an eye on, on the board of directors spring quarter because I think this will be coming to light as well as comments on the housing requirement, the two year mandatory housing requirement. Thank you, Tess, and thank you, Brian. Uh, we will now be moving on to our final moderator question. After this, we'll be responding to the audience. 
All right, so our final question is, what are the biggest issues affecting campus? And as president, how will you strive to assist those in various departments and campus organizations? Tess, we will start with you. You have two minutes. Okay, so um, to be completely honest, I think this question is really, really difficult because every single person on this campus is impacted by issues in different ways, depending on their own identity and lived experiences. Um, and I also think a lot of the issues we tend to talk about in higher ed, like racism and white supremacy and sexual assault, like just to name a very small fraction of what we talk about frequently, um, they're all really connected and intertwined. And so it's really hard to compartmentalize and, and focus on just one or two. And I'm normally not a fan of, of super broad answers, but in this case, I think like overall lack of cultural competency on this campus among student staff and administration is really our root issue. Um, and so often I think we see folks on our campus who have great intentions and they want to help, but they don't have education. So they end up hurting more than they're helping. And at the same time, as a public university, we have so many opportunities to educate ourselves, like specifically as students and to learn so we can really be supportive and empathetic as a campus community rather than performative in our activism. Um, you know, but this really, really takes folks who are <laughs> ready and willing to take on the work and it requires peer-on-peer -peer accountability and faculty-on-faculty -faculty accountability and calling out bad behavior and holding each other accountable and like deep changes in our admissions and our recruitment and our retention programs and changes in financial aid and <laughs> changes in the availability of comprehensive student support systems right um and like being realistic as asi president this is monumental this is a monumental task and I'm going to be completely honest in the fact that it's not a one-year project. It's not something that I'm going to be able to finish. But if we want a campus culture that, like, supports students, these are the issues we need to be focusing on. We can't just, like, compartmentalize and focus on one thing. We have to really view everything holistically. Thank you, Tess. Brian, you now have two minutes for your response. Yeah, so like I think just some of like the biggest issues affecting campus as what Tess was saying is just like the lack of cultural competency that has occurred. And I really want to take action to really ensure that there is more uh, resources for learning. I think uh, part of the thing, like as I said previously, I, uh, I want to advocate for more funding for cultural organizations through the committees and a lot of like the I know for a fact, like from la last year, that a lot of like the funding that they use goes into programming events, which I think will help. Also, I think like with everything that we have seen from like the Shades of Cal Poly picture, there is just, or sorry, Shades of Cal Poly Instagram page. I just think there is like a lot of microaggressions that occur on campus. Uh, sometimes like not intentionally, but other times intentionally. I think we need to take steps to ensure like in terms of like the classroom environment, we just need less microaggressions and more cultural competency. And one of the steps I want to take to help try and ensure that is for uh, work with the academic senate to ensure that teachers take mandatory bias training as students normally do during uh, before the fall quarter. And uh, while this may not be like an easy goal and it may not like get as much as we want done, it'll be like a first step to try and make Cal Poly a more diverse and inclusive place. Thank you, Brian. Tess, you now have one minute for your rebuttal. Okay, cool. I think just like on a on a last note in terms of cultural competency and, and ASI, like being super honest, like looking in the mirror, like there's a lot of work that needs to be done internally. And so I was listening to myself talk and I just wanted to like point out the fact that we absolutely should be making these strides, but I will absolutely be the first to acknowledge that like folks on this campus have been doing the work for years and ASI is relatively new to this space and it's not our job to jump in and like repeat other people's work, but it's really about supporting other people's work. And I think that's kind of um, issues impacting campus in terms of where does ASI fit in? Like we have platform, we have funding, we have amazing staff, we have students who are dedicated, 
but how do we support other folks who have been doing the work? Like, we don't need to repeat the work. We need to be supporting folks who have been doing the work and like giving them the recognition that they deserve. Thanks, Tess. Brian, you now have one minute for your final rebuttal. Oh, thank you, Bree. Yeah, so basically, just in terms of that, yeah, like ASI student government, like we pride ourselves as serving as like the official advocates for students. And I think really just like, I think we need to be more of a resource in helping students. Like we, we have like the connections between faculty members and administration. I think really just outreach is the key to things. Like literally again, as I've said, 17% of students turned out last year and before the year before that it was 14%. So that really shows that we are not as engaged with students as we really should be. And I think just providing support in general with like what clubs need, with what organization needs is like the key to ensuring that we could have a successful student experience for next year. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Tess, for answering all of our questions today. Uh, for our remaining time together, we will be answering a couple questions from the audience uh, that we are collecting from our community. If you have any questions for our candidates, please ask them now by commenting on our Facebook live stream now. <laughs> Each candidate will have two full minutes to respond to the audience question. There will be no rebuttal. The first question. How will you actively fight against and work to dismantle the blatant systemic racism at Cal Poly? Brian, we will begin with you. You have two minutes to answer the question. Yes, thank you. And that's uh, whoever submitted that question, that's a really great question. I think traditionally the ASI presidency has been like, in order to try and solve solutions, you just like throw programming at it and just hope the situation gets resolved. And while programming can be a good thing when it's useful, it's really, it really hasn't been in some cases in terms of like uh, dismantling white supremacy on campus. And basically what I want to do is I want to identify policies that contribute to systemic racism and literally work to advocate, uh, advocate against those policies and repeal them or even amend them so that they could be more inclusive to students. Another thing I am hoping to do is there is uh, a lot of the work that's done on campus is through university-wide committees. And I'm really hoping to work with the university-wide committees on committees, that's like the actual names of like the head of all these committees. What I want to do to work towards that is perhaps try and find a way to establish a university-wide committee that identifies like policies on campus that have contributed to systemic racism and get like a, just a diverse group of people from students to faculty to administrators to come together and work on this so that we can make Cal Poly just more accessible for students of color. Thank you, Brian, for your response. Tess, the floor is now yours. You'll have two minutes to answer the question. Awesome. Well, first, yeah, thank you for the question. I just want to acknowledge that this is obviously like a huge topic that I don't think anybody could cover in two minutes. So I'm going to do my best. But in terms of like systemic racism and systemic issues, like you have to work on changing the system. And a lot of that does have to happen through policy and advocacy on changing the very specific um, like fundamental ways we operate as a university. So if we know we have issues with recruiting and re retaining like diverse faculty, how are you changing the hiring process? How are you changing your search committees? How are you changing your recruiting firms? We have similar problems internally at ASI. We're looking at, can you move to a new search firm? Can you change the questions you're asking candidates? Like, what are you actually doing to change the systems? Um, but I think another huge part of this too is, is really, you know, our student body tends to repost on Instagram, like write statements, but like, what is the actual action that is happening on campus? And when we talk about like equity, that's not a comfortable thing for folks, like when you're looking at disparities in, in resources. And so one example is, is financial aid in the ASIC. We're one of like the very few um, organizations on campus that doesn't have built-in financial aid. 
And so you work towards building in financial aid to our fee, which means fees are going to go up for some students and down for some students. And that requires a referendum. And like that is a matter of equity. Folks who can pay the fee are going to pay. And then folks who need the financial aid are going to get the financial aid. Um, but none of that is going to be able to pass if students aren't in support. So I think things like AB 1460, very big picture when we're looking at ways to educate our students about what equity actually looks like in policies so we can get these policies to pass and be supported and not just tolerated by our campus community. That's really how you work towards those very big systemic changes. Thank you so much, Tess and Brian, for your thoughtful responses to the question. Our next audience question is this. In light of the Kristen Smart News, how will you ensure that students feel safe on campus? I believe that we began with Brian on the last question. So this question, we will begin with Tess. Tess, you have two minutes to answer the question. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, first of all, I just want to acknowledge that like Safer put out great resources and statements. And I know that like this topic can be very sensitive and triggering for some students. So like, please make sure you check those out if that's something you need. Um, but in terms of like safety, again, like all of these issues have to do with like campus culture and accountability and creating a campus where students feel obligated to look out for each other. And like, I don't know how many of y'all feel like you can walk around campus and just stop and like chat and have casual conversations and be excited or are com like would be comfortable walking alone. Like even if there's other students and know like, wow, something were to happen, like somebody would stick up for me. Um, and so I, I do think like it is the responsibility of, of the campus community to really just work on caring about each other a little bit more. And I know we're all coming out of COVID um, and it's different. We have different comfort levels. Um, but when you talk about like safety, like you feel safe when you're in a community where you feel loved. And so how do we work on shifting campus culture away from, in my opinion, what is very individualistic and towards having people feeling accountable for their peers and feeling accountable for other folks and their actions. And so, um, yes, I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much, Tess. Brian. The floor is now yours. You will have two minutes. Thank you, Parker. So, yeah, basically, in just the light of what's all going on, I think like public safety is like a big concern of mine, something I want to pursue as ASI president. I think like we need to reimagine like what public safety looks like in light of like all the conversations that have been going on as we are heading back to in person towards more community based solutions. In like regards to women, I can like, I know that there are like many women who uh, do not feel like safe sometimes walking alone on campus, like especially at night. And I think uh, there are really two tangible policies that I want to work on uh, to help combat this. Uh, one of them is I think there used to be like uh, an escort service that would be open like around nighttime for those who didn't feel safe. Uh, walking back to their dorm or house on campus, uh, they would be able to provide, uh, basically there would be some sort of service there that could provide them uh, safety to help walk back. But I think that was uh, cut with funding. So that would be something I want to look into. Another thing is uh, concerns the status of women committee. Uh, to my knowledge, there is a university-wide committee called the Status of Women Committee, and it's tasked with like understanding like what issues women face on campus. And they have not met, to my knowledge, in like I'm not sure two, three years. And I feel like, uh, and they oh, also they're in charge of the uh, sexual assault and discrimination policy. So I think really like. Uh, as ASI president, I'm hoping to work with administration to uh, try and revive that committee and just work to help create solutions to, yeah, help ensure that women feel safe on campus. Thank you for your response. Uh, our next audience question is, how will you support UUAB with its loss of reserves that it had saved for renovations? Uh, we we will start with you, Brian. Um. 
Yeah, so I remember this. So basically last year, the UUAB, what happened was with their reserves administration decided to uh, take a couple of million out of their reserves to fund it towards housing. But yet, despite this loan, there was, uh, yeah. So despite this loan, uh, there was still like an increase in housing fees and yeah, I think really what I want to do is to work with the University Union Advisory Board, oh, which uh, just for those who don't know, is tasked with like managing the facilities uh, that ASI owns, such as the Rec Center and UCU Center. I want to work with the administration to ensure how they are going to repay this loan and to also work towards like uh, be involved in like the budget process uh, more than like an ASI president normally would just to ensure that students could have like fun activities and uh, yeah, have fun events. And just like UUAB is like crucial to providing uh, students to their ultimate experience. And I think I just want to work to ensure that they have like the budget thingy in order to carry out that plan. Thank you, Brian. Tess, you are now, it's your floor. You have two minutes to answer that question. Awesome, I love it when it's my floor. <laughs> um, okay, so the good news is the budget situation this year from the governor is a lot better than anybody was expecting it to be. So in terms of funding, I know there were preliminary talks of that loan actually being paid back earlier, which would be very exciting. Um, but also just kind of like making a distinction, UAB falls on like this, the state side of the house. So that is money that um, ASI students advise, but we do not in our governing documents have direct control of versus the ASI budget, which is managed in house. And so um, just kind of like understanding that distinction. Um, one thing just to note is in terms like Chumash project is still happening at a scaled back version. And they're also doing a bathroom renovation on the lower level of the UU to include a gender neutral bathroom. And so in terms of kind of supporting and bolstering the funds that were lost in the Chumash re renovation, I think, um, part of being a good campus partner is contributing to other areas on campus when they are lacking. And that is why that loan happened. Um, but again, like the good news is that was a global pandemic. It is coming to an end. The budget is looking good. And so I don't think that loss of funds will be too detrimental, but the ASI reserves this year is actually very healthy. And we are looking for ways to support different entities on campus. And so students did come forward and express very, very strong needs and desires through UAB to want to do additional renovations. Um, that would be something that this year's board and officer team would be very much willing to consider in terms of the funding we have available through the end of the fiscal year. That was like a very complicated answer. I hope it made sense. <laughs> it did make sense. Thank you, Tess. And thank you, Brian, as well, for your thoughtful responses to that question. Our next audience question is on the topic of mental health. Several students have noted a decline in mental health during the pandemic. How will you ensure that mental health resources are accessible to students. Tess, we're gonna throw this question right back at you. Two minutes. Okay, awesome. So again, obviously mental health services require money, which means you have to advocate and you have to understand the budget. And so um, the university already seems very in favor of supporting mental health services. They know this is something that is impacting students and they also know that um, this is an area we have fallen short in the past, specifically when it comes to having culturally competent counselors or counselors of color to support folks of color on campus. And so um, we can continue to advocate for the budget increases. We can look for ways internally to directly support in ways that are legal that we can do with our funding for counseling services. Um, but one thing I know that has really emerged that can be very helpful for some folks and then other folks do require one-on-one -on -one attention is the use of like peer groups and support groups and dialogue groups. And so I think for as much as we can be strategic about having a very wide variety of resources available, all of which are gonna require different amounts of time and attention and funding um, and spaces on campus, but really being critical and evaluating like 
we need more support groups and they cost less money so we can serve more students this way or like you know support groups really aren't working for students right now and we should be focusing on finding culturally competent counselors so i think part of it is like collecting the data and then the second part is figuring out where the money's going to come from thank you tess for your response brian you know the drill two minutes to respond to the question oh yes i do parker so uh, basically in terms of like mental health, look, I just want to acknowledge that this has like just been like one of probably like the hardest years that have occurred. I mean, literally our college experience has been reduced to the camera and lens of Zoom to many of us. And uh, just like really two things I want to do. Uh, one like test say is for like ASI. ASI on its own could like along with uh, mental health or campus mental health resources is to basically maybe hold dialogues uh, like and we could reserve space within like the Schumash Auditorium or even the rec center uh, to allow for students to like process about how they have been feeling like as soon as public health guidelines permit. I think another thing is, and I've noticed this from Shades of Cal Poly as well, that a lot of like the mental resor health resources we have on campus are have been severely underfunded and are not able to provide like the full capacity and resources it needs in order to uh, support students. So I think really what I want to do is uh, in addition to providing more funding, I really want to work with outside organizations as well to help uh, find counseling support for students and uh, provide opportunities on campus. I think that would be like the best way to, look, this is part of my platform of campus slash community engagement. We can engage with the community to ensure that students uh, have the mental health resources they need that way, uh, students can just be uh, able to really thrive on campus rather than just like survive. Awesome. Thank you guys for your responses. Uh, we do have one more question for you. Uh, in what ways can you strengthen a relationship between the administration and the student body? Brian, we'll start with you. Thanks. Well, I think like the best way, just in any situation towards unity, and I've uh, dealt with this before with my uh, political experience and serving in political campaigns, is really just listening to one another and just try and understand where they're coming from. Uh, this is how I just want to deal with administration because Look, administration has done a lot of good things for students, but they've also done a lot of like bad things that uh, in terms of policies and uh, even uh, sometimes in lack of support. So I think really the key is to be honest. And that is something I will always do as ASI president is to be honest, like be willing to have like dip, be diplomatic into friendly conversation, but at the same time, really be assertive and say, hey, I know what you're doing is you think it might be good for students, but really these are the effects. And I, yeah, it's just about really needing to relay concerns. And uh, even as uh, an ASI board director, I was surprised to how like how much sometimes uh, they would listening in terms of a response. So I just really would want to, I want to ensure that there is a friendly relationship at the same time. There is honesty about what's going on between campus and the students. And it's like, uh, yeah, just like ensure that there's accountability in that aspect. Thank you, Brian. Tess, you now have two minutes to answer the question. Awesome. Okay. So I also like share a lot of, I think when you work in ASI a little bit, sometimes you realize the fact that, um, it, yes, administration sometimes are not making student friendly decisions, but a lot of times that can genuinely come from the fact that they're not understanding the consequences like that are happening to students. And so I remember one time I was sitting with president Armstrong, we were chatting 
and and we we're kind of butting heads on something and then we got both kind of realized he's like Tess like we are literally both moving towards the same goal but we are on completely different paths and sometimes that's what the hiccup is I feel like when students are communicating with administration as we both do want common goals like I do think our administration genuinely wants the best for the students, but we have very different viewpoints on how to get there and what needs to happen to be at a place where students are most happy and fulfilled and comfortable on campus. And so in terms of improving relationships, I think to a certain extent, just very frequent communication, which I felt very fortunate to have been able to be involved with this year in terms of asking questions and getting clarification. And sometimes like it doesn't need to be a resolution or it doesn't need to be a story on Mustang news. It could literally just be sitting down and having a 15 minute conversation um, like parking for saliva testing. That was just not something that had popped up and it like came up in an ASI space and we emailed Dr. Humphrey. And we're like, hello, like, is it possible to have free parking? This is a deterrent for students. And they're like, oh my gosh, we didn't even think of that. Like, of course. And like, it happens. And so I think, um, in terms of having a good working relationship, like absolutely at the end of the day, we are diehard like advocates for the students, but sometimes we do need to be willing to give administration the benefit of the doubt and not always come in on the defense because that can really just cause like clashing heads right off the bat. Thank you candidates for answering our bonus questions. Uh, you will now each have two minutes to make a closing statement. Uh, Brian, you may begin. Yes, so for my closing statement, like throughout this debate, I have presented my ideas for what I not only want to see on campus, but have been working uh, with many students to see what they would like to see happening on campus in order to have the best and ultimate student experience for next year. And really, I just want to say, like, in terms of my closing statements, I'm hoping to work for you to create a student government that is willing to make more tangible policies occur that is noticeable. And I just want to increase communication. And again, I believe I would be the best candidate for that because of my political experience in serving on uh, various campaigns and city council and school board within the county. And uh, just in conclusion, if you would like to contact me with any questions about you, what you would like to see, my email my Cal Poly email is bkragh at calpoly.edu. I also have an Instagram page for my campaign, which is at Brian for, the, like the number four, ASI Prez. So please like follow me or DM me. But like, yeah, if you just have anything you would want to see happen on campus or any concerns you have, yeah, just contact me. I am an open resource and yeah, I think that's it for my concluded remarks. I just want to thank Mustang thank you, so much, and I'll leave it there. <laughs> Tess, you have two minutes for your closing statement. Awesome. Okay, well, I just want to start by saying, like, thank you all for tuning in and for listening. And again, like, at the end of the day, we just want voter turnout. And I hope you've learned a lot about both of us and you make an informed decision and you're comfortable about who's managing your student fees come next year. Um, I am not a perfect person. I am nowhere close to being perfect, but I care a lot. Like, I know that sounds super cheesy, but I just care. I care about students. I care about your experience. I care about, like, how you are doing as a person. Um, I think most people who work with me know that I will always prioritize, like, you as a person over the work. Like, this is the first year we have, like, canceled board meetings for people's mental health and, like, really tried to humanize ASI as a system that cares about students. Um, that is how I choose to lead. I choose to lead with empathy and with grace for folks. And I think moving into this position, if I were to be elected, like all of my same philosophies um, of leadership would definitely apply. And so I would just encourage you all to make an informed decision on April 21st. And if you, I have your vote, that's awesome. And if not, I am just happy you are voting. So I hope everybody has a good Thursday. Thank you so much to our candidates, Tess and Brian, and thank you to the audience for tuning in and keeping our candidates on their toes with your thoughtful and amazing questions. This concludes the ASI presidential debate. Please stay tuned to April 20th for a candidate meet and greet that will be hosted by ASI. Thank you again for watching. With ASI, I'm Parker Swanson.
And with Mustang News, I'm Brady Kasky. Have a great day, folks.